When I found out about this news today, it made me very happy because what it proved to me is that people are not falling for all of the BS that we are continually being told. Because now, a lot of people are thinking that mortgage rates are gonna hit double digit territory within the next three years. So if people were drinking the Kool-Aid and thinking that, oh, everything is great and we're gonna be lowering interest rates soon, nobody would be thinking that. Everybody would be expecting mortgage rates to go back down to 4% in the next couple of years. But instead, it's the opposite. Everybody's thinking that it's gonna go up, guys. It makes me so happy to hear that because it just means that people are paying attention. People are seeing what's happening with inflation. People are seeing what's happening with interest rates and they're realizing that this isn't going away anytime soon. According to a new survey from the New York Fed, consumers on average said that over the next year they expect 30-year mortgage rates to rise to 8.7% and within three years to 9.7% and both of which are series high according to the New York Fed. To me what that also says is people who answered this and said this are pessimistic on the economy, which means that they know what's really going on. Regardless of what we're being told about the GDP numbers and unemployment and jobs and all of this, people are starting to ignore that stuff and face reality. But not everybody's thinking like that because on average, people are thinking there's still a 61% chance that rates will fall over the next 12 months, which is also a series high. So once again, you always have people in both camps, right? Some people think that it's gonna go up, some people think that it's gonna go down. But you know, last October, interest rates went over 8% for the first time in like, I don't know, 30 years, something like that. And now recently, they're already back up to close to 7.3%. And that's for people with very good credit, good income, and a decent down payment. And so if you don't have those things, then you're probably looking at over an 8% mortgage rate right now if you're not gonna be buying down some points. Now the Fed has been doing this survey since 2014. These numbers are basically reflecting the worst outlook that we've seen since then, which is not really that much of a surprise considering in 2014, we were already basically recovered from the GFC and things were starting to go good again. But it is interesting here because within this survey, even though people expect interest rates to go into double digit territory, they also think that home prices are gonna rise 5.1% over the next year as well, which doesn't really make a lot of sense because the higher mortgage rates go, the more unaffordable it becomes for people to buy, which means you're just gonna have less and less people buying homes in general. Now you could argue, well, that also means that you're gonna have less people selling homes because of the interest rates being high. And that is a fair point. However, when you're a buyer, for example, there's no rush to buy, okay? Some people say, oh, I have to buy because I'm having a kid or I have to buy because I'm moving or whatever. You don't have to buy. What you need is you need a place to live. So you don't have to buy. But sellers, on the other hand, when they're in a position where they need to sell, it doesn't matter what's happening with the housing market or where interest rates are at or if we're in a recession or not. What, ha what happens is when somebody needs to sell the property, they have to sell it now. And so, I don't think this argument long term is going to hold up well because interest rates are high. It's going to have the lock in effect and keep everybody, you know, sitting still. And this is already being proven to be not true because this year we've seen inventory already pick up like 14% year over year. And we're already getting close. Not we're not there, but we're close to pre-pandemic inventory levels. I think we're about 20% away from being there. So it's not like we're that far off from having inventory back at normal levels, guys. And this is a time when interest rates are still near the highest that they've been in 30 years. So this argument that people are gonna hang on to their low interest rates indefinitely, I don't think is really gonna hold up because you're gonna have people that are going to sell slash need to sell regardless of what's going on. We're already seeing it happen now. But not only are people expecting home prices to increase, they're also expecting rent prices to go up by 9.7% over the next year and 5.1% over the next five years. Now that's an even steeper increase than the sales number. And this is where it kind of starts falling apart for me because what people expect to happen and what actually might happen can be two very different things. 
And this is where that shows because the rent prices have not been going up hardly at all because the rental inventory is abundant now in many areas across the country. And we're still gonna be getting another half a million uh, rental units delivered onto the market this year. So the rental inventory is not something we have a shortage of anymore. For people to expect rent prices to go up by 9.1% in a year from now is pretty unrealistic, I would say. In fact, it might even go down by that amount. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the most recent uh, rental data from apartment list, rent prices only rose 0.5% in April. So that is not much of an increase at all. It's basically staying flat. And at that rate, we are not going to see a 9% increase in rents in the next year. And ever since the Fed has been keeping track of this data, since 2014, they found out that the high prices and mortgage rates are discouraging people from moving to the lowest point since they've been keeping track. So that's not a surprise either, considering we're in the most extreme situation that we've been in since they've been tracking this data. The most concerning part of this though, is that 74.2% of renters who answered this survey said that they think they would have trouble obtaining an, a mortgage, which is an 8.4% increase from just a year ago. So. As you can see, less and less people are thinking that they're ever gonna be able to buy a home, which is not good that people are giving up. It's good that people are paying attention and realizing that interest rates will probably go up because inflation has not been tamed like they keep telling us, but it's not good if people are giving up on this idea that they'll ever be able to own a home. Because at the same token, only 40% of renters said that they would ever own a home, which is down by 4.3 percentage points from a year ago and also marks a brand new low on this survey so people's morale is getting crushed with this housing market and the current conditions that we're in but i don't know why because they have so many programs out there to get people into a house who really can't even afford one that's right guys you can already get a three and a half percent down mortgage with fha right but if you're that broke and they feel sorry enough for you then you can literally get into the house with zero money down that's right because there are programs out there that you could take advantage of as an FHA home buyer to get your 3.5% down payment covered as well. Now, I'm not saying people should do this because honestly, if you don't have enough money to even get an FHA mortgage by yourself without needing a helping hand, you really can't afford to be a homeowner, guys. I hate to break it to you like that, but it's just the honest truth because owning a home is very expensive. Once you get into the home, there's taxes, there's insurance, there's maintenance and upkeep, there's surprise expenses that you never thought of, there's changes you need to make to the house sometimes to make it more functional and livable. And all of those things come at an extra cost. So even at the median home price today, about $400,000, you know, three and a half percent down is only like $14,000, $15,000, maybe 16 with closing costs. So that's not a lot of money when it comes to buying a house. So if you need to borrow that 15 grand to become a homeowner, then you're not ready. You know, you see these mortgage companies like Fairway Mortgage and other mortgage companies are probably doing this as well, where, you know, they have all these programs. Like here in Florida, we have the Hometown Heroes program. Well, they'll give you all this money for a down payment on a house to the point where it's cheaper for you to move into that house and buy it than it would be to rent something similar, guys. This is the same type of crazy behavior we saw right before the last housing crash, when people who really aren't qualified, especially financially, to be able to buy homes end up buying them. Because this is the only way they can keep this show on the road right now. This whole thing is one big smoke show that is being propelled by all of these fake artificial stimulus programs like this one. So people who are doing this are using additional down payment assistance, okay? Here's an example of qualifications you would need in Los Angeles County to qualify for something like this. You need to have a low income, which means you're making $58,000 a year or less over there for one person household, or at least a moderate income, which is $61,000 a year or less. And those numbers will change by household size. So the less money you make, the more free money they will give you to buy a house. If you just rewind to what I just said a few minutes ago, you probably aren't gonna be able to afford the house once you're actually in it because of how expensive it is to be a homeowner. And in especially a place like Los Angeles, for example, it's funny they use this here as the example scenario because LA is notoriously one of those places where it is far cheaper to be a renter than a homeowner. 
So you're telling me somebody who's making 58 grand a year is gonna be able to get down payment assistance and get into a house with no money down, but then once they get into the house, their payment is gonna be double or triple what their rent used to be and somehow they're gonna be able to keep up with that? No, they're not. <laughs> Now in Michigan, at least they have a little bit stricter qualification standards, not with the income, because you can even make over $100,000 a year and qualify for this down payment assistance over there. But you need to have at least a 640 credit score, which is higher than the FHA requirement of 580, by the way. Even if you qualify for an FHA loan, you still wouldn't qualify for down payment assistance in a state like Michigan, unless your credit score is 640 or higher. And also, they won't let you buy a house that's more than $224,500. And they're giving you a loan for down payment, which must be repaid when the house is sold. So it's not free money that you get to keep forever. It's not a grant. You have to pay this back when you sell your house. So at least there's a safeguard here on the purchase price because that's where this falls apart for me, guys. Like people who have low incomes cannot afford to buy the median price home today. Yeah, they might be able to afford to buy a cheaper home like this one, but there needs to be more safeguards in place for stuff like this so people don't get into the house and end up in foreclosure a year later. But depending on the state and the down payment assistance program, they're giving people anywhere between 100 and 105% of the financing to buy these houses, guys. The last time this happened, we ended up in a giant housing crash. And it seems like we didn't learn anything from back then. You know, they like to say that the lending standards are better today. And, you know, only people who are well qualified are buying homes. But apparently this isn't true because otherwise these programs wouldn't exist. They're even making it easier for buyers to purchase a four unit property. So basically a multifamily that's still considered residential with as little as 5% down. Okay, prior to November of 2023, you had to have 25% down to buy a property like this. So they're trying to get people who don't have any money to buy these properties. Why? Because the housing market's slow, the mortgage industry is dead right now, and it's all starting to unravel. They're trying to put these programs in place to prevent it from unraveling even further. But I think people that are on this low of an income scale are even gonna realize like, I can't afford this. Most people are probably gonna say, even though they're giving this to me, I'm not gonna do it because I don't wanna financially ruin myself. And they're also making it so if you buy a house with an ADU, so for example, say this little house over here had a guest house in the back, that'd be considered an ADU. Looks like it even does have a guest house in the back. Then you can use the income that you're making from that little guest house to qualify as part of the income needed to buy this house, guys. So they're assuming that you're gonna have that guest house rented and you're already ready to be a landlord and you're gonna be making all this extra money and they're using that money to qualify people to buy these properties. Does that sound like a good idea? Does that sound like that's gonna end well in the future, especially if there's a vacancy or this person has no idea how to be a landlord and keep their tenants? Probably not. Things are so slow with real estate right now that the White House recently came out with a proposed new tax credit, okay? which is aimed at undoing some of this mortgage rate lock-in that we're supposedly seeing, which I don't think is actually happening because we are seeing more and more listings hit the market. But what they want to do is they want to give uh, home sellers of starter homes in particular, which is defined as homes that are below the median house price in their county, would receive up to $10,000 as a tax credit to sell their house. This is gonna help the lock-in effect because this extra 10 grand is gonna help them buy down the rate on their next house. Because typically when someone sells a small starter home, they're gonna move into a larger and more expensive home. And at today's interest rates and prices can be prohibitively expensive for somebody in that position. However, the government's thinking, well, if we give them an extra 10 grand, they'll be able to buy down the mortgage rate some and get them into that house. Well, first of all, 10 grand isn't gonna be enough to buy it down to an affordable level at today's prices and rates, that's for sure. And I'm not saying they should give people in this position more money. I don't think they should even give them any money at all. I think they should just stay out of it because they're just butting into everything nowadays and trying to keep this whole magic show on the road, but it's not working. In fact, it's estimated that in order to make this tax credit worthwhile to actually get people in these starter homes to sell, that the tax credit would need to be 
be about $50,000 to compensate these people for giving up their lower mortgage rate because they're going to need that amount of money to buy down the rate to an affordable level at the new homes at today's prices. And then they say in here, which is hilarious, that if the $10,000 tax credit is too small to be effective, then a larger subsidy would come with substantial risks meaning increased government spending could create inflationary pressure, forcing the Fed to keep interest rates higher for longer. Like, really? No. I think everything they're doing already is already having that effect, if you ask me, because just the fact that all these programs we already just covered in this video even exist, they're all inflationary. They're all encouraging people to spend. They're all encouraging people to borrow. And the whole point of having high interest rates, in case everybody forgot, is to prevent people from borrowing, to prevent people from spending, to slow it down, which it hasn't been working, which is why I keep saying rates need to go even higher, because if they were, that would start maybe doing the job, but they're not high enough yet to stop people from borrowing. Another thing that they're looking at trying to figure out is how you can get mortgage servicers to have people take their mortgages with them to the next property they buy that way they don't have to worry about getting a new mortgage but even that probably won't do enough to solve this problem because even if people were allowed to take their mortgages with them to a new house people usually buy a bigger more expensive house right so say you have a two hundred thousand dollar balance on your mortgage and you only have a three percent rate or a four percent whatever it is way below what you can get today and now you're going to buy a house that costs half a million dollars now you need to throw an additional two hundred thousand dollars worth of debt onto that property now i need a second mortgage at two hundred thousand dollars at today's rates at seven and a half percent or so so even that would still make it prohibitively expensive for people to move to a new house. But you see, the idea here of what they're trying to do is finagle different things into the market to get things moving, to get more people to sell, and to get transactions moving again. Because the industry is dying. We're already starting to see the numbers with the National Association of Realtors start to shrink, as well as the amount of mortgage applications are near 30-year lows right now. So that's not good. At least in the government's eyes, it's not. Now, apparently, in the UK and Canada, they have something called portability, which allows uh, mortgage borrowers to port their mortgage when moving in exchange for a fee, which they say would be more effective and less inflationary than subsidies. And I agree. I wish we had that here in the US because that would make it a lot easier for somebody who wants to move and do that without having to worry about getting a 7.5% rate. But the problem is the mortgage servicers and the mortgage industry doesn't want things like this to happen because that's not very profitable. Writing you a brand new loan or refinancing you is how they make all their money, not collecting an arbitrary fee for a portability in order to give you a nice new house at the same rate. So you can rest assured that the government is sitting there brainstorming all day long right now trying to find ways to unlock this housing market but i think no matter what they do honestly in the long run it will fail guys because these high prices is what ultimately will make it fail unless they literally start paying for houses for all of us and getting giving everybody a free house short of that there's nothing that they're really going to be able to do to change this market in my opinion in fact on the other end of this spectrum they're doing other things that could make it even worse and, and make it even harder for people to sell. You know, there's this whole proposal to bring up this 44% capital gains tax from the Biden administration. Well, even if they don't do that, okay? In 2023, 8% of home sales brought in windfalls of over $500,000, which is the, the limit for married couples to be exempt from capital gains taxes, okay? which is more than double the amount of homes that brought in that kind of windfall in 2019. So more than double the people in 2019 are paying heavy capital gains taxes on the sales of their houses already, and they want to increase that number even further. So how is that gonna encourage people to sell? It won't. <laughs> now I hate taxes. A lot of people who watch my channel probably know this. I try to pay as little taxes as possible when it comes to my accounting and I take every deduction I can possibly get because I would rather use that money to further grow my business or do something else with the money besides give it to Uncle Sam and have them waste it on illegal immigration, for example, or any other thing that they decide to throw the money away on. Here's the other problem, guys. Even though inflation has been surging over the past several years, 
One thing that hasn't changed are these limits for capital gains taxes. They're still stuck where they were decades ago and they haven't gone up even though inflation has. So it's much easier to get a much bigger windfall when selling a property than before. And obviously all of that money that you're getting doesn't go as far as it used to. So naturally the limit should be pushed higher. Now basically how capital gains taxes work right now is if you're single and you make more than $250,000 profit when selling your house, then the excess is taxed at capital gains rates. And if you're a married couple, that limit is $500,000. And then there's many other little nuances and details with how you are taxed with capital gains taxes. But basically, if you look at this chart here, this shows you in which states people are paying the most capital gains taxes. You know, not surprisingly, California, Hawaii, Washington, DC, et cetera, down the list, the places where buying a house is the most expensive and people, you know, bought you know, a couple decades ago and now are selling the house for 10, 15 times what they paid for it back then. So naturally you're gonna have a big windfall when selling this property and you're gonna have capital gains taxes. And here's the crazy thing. All those states where people pay the most capital gains taxes as far as the percentage of people who qualify for paying this, those states also have their own capital gains taxes. So you would have to pay even more if this new uh, higher capital gains tax proposal goes through. So it's all just crazy. It's a crazy stuff, you know, that's just gonna discourage people from selling their homes and try to find some other type of loophole to get around it. Now, for anybody who's potentially facing this situation where you may be on the hook to pay capital gains taxes, the best thing you can do, and hopefully you've done this over the years of owning your home, if not, then this might not work for you. But if you're just getting started, you want to make sure you keep track of all the money you invest into your home, guys. You make an improvement to your home, you put in a pool, you put on a new roof, you know, you remodel stuff, save all those receipts and document everything. Because all those improvements can be deducted in the end against what you would owe in capital gains taxes if you make a big windfall. You know, that can literally save you hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases if you end up making enough money when you sell. So it really is worth it to keep track of those expenses when you own a home. And the other way you can get around this if you don't wanna pay capital gains taxes, if you notice that say you're a married couple and the amount of money that you might profit on selling your home is getting close to exceeding that half a million dollars, then you could also sell the home before you get to that point in order to make sure that you're not going to have to pay these capital gains taxes, assuming you lived in the house for at least two years. You know, if you're trying to flip it within a matter of months and get away from it, it's not gonna work. But the idea is that they are trying to do everything they can to keep this thing going and it's just not working, guys. It really isn't. People are boycotting this market, whether it's by choice or by necessity because of affordability. And I don't think anything that they're gonna do is gonna change that until prices come down substantially. So if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you don't wanna wait for my next video to come out, check out this one on the screen right over here. And I'll see you in the next one.